Hello and welcome for the lesson. My name is Beth Mwangi from the School of Hospitality, Travel and Tourism Management, Department of Hospitality Management. Uh, the unit is uh, DHT 1207 and the unit title is uh, Food Production Theory 1. And our title, the topic is on uh, vegetables. But before we go to the topic, let's look at um, the uh, objectives. By the end of the lesson, you should be able to at least identify various classifications of vegetables. Uh, you should also be able to describe uh, various cooking methods used for some uh, different classifications of vegetables. And also, you should be able to identify at least examples of some uh, vegetables. Uh, for introduction, why are vegetables important? Remember, they are the main, one of the common or most common types of food commodities that we use in the kitchen. They play a very big role in cookery. Vegetables are versatile. They can be used as starters. And for starters, you're talking about appetizers. So we can use vegetables as salads. They're very excellent as appetizers before the main meal. Vegetables are also used uh, as the main meal as part of their uh, well, vitamins. They provide us with vitamins. And vegetables can also be used in some cases uh, for snacks. We put them as fillings or stuffings in meat pies and all that, samosas and all that. So vegetables are very versatile. Their use in the kitchen cannot actually be underestimated. So they are very important and therefore it is important we understand more about them, how to handle them, what happens when they are cooked and how to make sure that you know we cook them appropriately and we conserve all the nutrients in the vegetables. Remember, of course, nutritionally speaking, vegetables are very, very uh, healthy. And it is important that we include them. Actually, uh, nutritionally, we are supposed to have more servings of vegetables than any other, uh, you know, vitamins, the starches and the proteins. So vegetables are much more appreciated, as I said, not only for their nutritional importance, but for their variety. I've said they can be used in different uh, ways or forms in the kitchen. We also have them in different flavors, depending on the categories or types of vegetables. They also bring what we call eye appeal. So they make a plate uh, look good, look appealing, look appetizing. And for that reason, we cannot have a meal without uh, vegetables. They also have that issue of elegance or sophistication. When you cut them into different styles and you add them onto a plate, they make you know, the plate look good, elegant, and you know, sophisticated. When you use your artistic skills as a chef to cut different vegetable cuts, as we shall see. So they bring all these elements into the menu. And one thing to remember, one factor to consider when you're handling vegetables is that they are so perishable and we all know whether they are whatever category or classification of vegetables they are, the issue of perishability, they have a short lifespan or you know, shelf life. So we have to consider that fact. They are perishable and therefore that means we require extra care from receiving the time we receive them at the food service operation to the time we serve them to a seated customer. The other element is freshness. It is, this is their most appealing and attractive quality, and therefore we must at all times make sure that we you know, retain the freshness. We make sure that we serve them with all the freshness as much as we can, so we preserve it as much as we can. Now, the goals of proper vegetable cookery are therefore to enhance, uh, to preserve uh, them, and to enhance their flavor, their texture, and their color. So when you're serving, those three elements have to be there, good color, good texture, and good flavor. That's very, very important. Uh, we now look at classification of vegetables, or rather the types or categories of vegetables that are in existence. And to classify vegetables, there are so many ways. We have the scientific method of classification, but because here we are looking at food production or in the food service industry, we won't look at you know the, 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 the scientific classification where we have the scientific names. Rather, we borrow a leaf from botanical classification, and botanically, we classify vegetables according to this part of the plant, looking at a whole plant. We normally have the flower, we have the fruits, we have the stems, we have the, you know, the shoots, and we have the roots. So the botanical classification is what basically helps a chef to understand the type of a vegetable. So to start with, we are going to look at root vegetables. The root, as the name suggests, they are taken from the root part of uh, a plant. And we have various examples like carrots, they're very commonly used uh, in a meal. 
We also have beetroots, we have radishes, turnips, swedes, parsnips, etc. As long as it is grown under the ground and it is a root vegetable. And those are just a few examples. We have so many examples of root vegetables. As we can see, those are just a few. We have the carrots. We all know carrots. Very good, very nutritious because of, you know, uh, what they give uh, to the body. We have radish there and we have the parsnip. All these are examples of root vegetables. They can be cooked in many styles, many, many styles. You can steam them, you can stew them, you know, you can, there are many, many, and they can be used even for many meal sessions. They can be used as uh, appetizers or, you know, starters. They can be used in the main meal. You can also use them as garnishes. So those are examples of root vegetables. The second category of uh, vegetables we have are the tubers, the tubers. Examples of tubers, they are also grown underground, but we don't, we, we, we do not, we need to be careful so that we don't confuse between roots and tubers, okay? So examples are Irish potatoes, we have sweet potatoes, we have artichokes, we have um, yams, all these are examples of root vegetables. In our picture there, as you can see, we have the potatoes, the Irish potatoes, and we have the sweet potatoes. This is basically what we call viazi vitamu in Swahili. They can be used in uh, various ways for the potatoes. You can actually use them even as starters. We have potato salad, a good starter. We can use potatoes in the main meal. You can use them whole. You can defry them, commonly called as, known as chips or french fries. You can also use them, you know, uh, mashed, pureed potatoes. We have duchess potatoes. We have potato croquettes. I mean, they are very, they, they, they can be used in a, in a variety of ways. Sweet potatoes, the same way, but the most commonly known one is, you know, used as a breakfast item. They are excellent. We all know that they are very healthy. Instead of having to take, you know, foods that are very oily and all that, eh, basically, uh, sweet potatoes can play that particular uh, role. So those were tubers. The third category are what we call bulbs. The bulbs, examples include onions and the onions are different categories we have the leeks we have the shallots we have the garlic and there are so many other examples of bulb uh, vegetables uh, on our picture there we have different uh, types of onions we have the red onions i think this is the most common the red onions we have the white onions most commonly used for salads and then we have the leeks leeks they are excellent in flavor. They have a very strong flavor, basically used for soups. You can use leeks for stews. You can use it for stocks. They can be used in all manner of ways. And in most cases, onions are used in almost every meal, especially when we have to fry our foods. We always have to cut some onions. We add a little bit of oil, and then we fry whatever we are frying. So that is the category of bulbs. Uh, category number four or classification number four, we have the leafy vegetables. As the name suggests, leafy vegetables are taken from the leaf, the leaf part of a plant. And we also have a variety of examples of leafy vegetables. On our picture here, we have the spinach. We all know spinach. Then we have still a different kind of spinach, looking, having a kind of a red stalk, but we call it Swiss card. It's also very excellent. Spinach can be used for stews. We can use it for, as in the main meal, as uh, vegetables. You can also use it for making soup. Actually, it's very, very excellent. And because of, you know, the green uh, coloring matter, chlorophyll, they give us a lot of, you know, nutrients. And as we shall see, when cooking, we have to make sure that we have to aspire to make sure that we preserve that chlorophyll. So you don't have to serve your spinach when they are off green, olive green. They have to be. The, the, the usual deep green that they are. So this is a category of leafy vegetables, and I said the word comes from leaves, meaning they are taken from the leaf part of the plant. Category number five, we call them the brassicas or cruciferous vegetables, or they can also be called the cabbage family uh, vegetables. And of course, uh, one example, the most common is uh, cabbage, the normal cabbage. We have the green cabbage, and we have so many other types of cabbage. Uh, we also have broccoli, we have cauliflower, we have the red cabbage, we have Brussels sprouts, Chinese cabbage. So that is why I called them the cabbage family because all types of cabbage are actually classified under brassicas 
or cruciferous vegetables. On our pictures here, we have one, the green cabbage, the most common, this one. Then we have the red cabbage. It might look like it's purple, but we don't call it purple cabbage, we call it red cabbage. Very excellent in terms of uh, flavor, in terms of, you know, even uh, seasoning food, in terms of enlivening the color of food. We have the cauliflower here, and many people actually uh, confuse between cauliflower and broccoli. As you can see on our illustrations, eh, they are different. Color-wise, they are different, and even, even in, in taste, they are different. So cauliflower is much more compact. It's white, but has green stalks, as you can see. Broccoli is green and has also green stalks. It's, it's much less you know, compact compared to cauliflower. Then down here, we have Brussels sprouts. They're like small cabbage, okay, called Brussels sprouts. So these are excellent also sources of vitamins and many other um, nutrients. They are excellent. They can be used in all styles uh, in a meal session. Number six, category number six, we have the pods and seeds, meaning there's a pod and seeds inside. Examples, we have beans, we have peas, we have sweet corn, there is okra and we have mulched out or snow peas. Now, when we talk about a pod, it means there is a pod outside. And the pod is actually what houses the seeds inside. That's why we're calling this category pods and seeds. So on our picture here, as you can see on the illustration, we have the sweet corn. Uh, many people call it the yellow maize. So it, it has the outer covering. Basically, this is its pod, the green part. And then, of course, we have the inside where you have the, uh, the, 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 the seeds. You thresh them and then you can use them in many styles, different styles in a meal session. They can be used in salads. They can be used even as toppings. For example, we have some pizzas that are made of corn, sweet corn as a topping. Then we have the beans. Now, the beans here, we have the pod, this outer covering. Then we have the seeds inside here. So the beans, they're also very common, but know that these are green, when they are green. Once they dry, then they are not vegetables, they fall under legumes or pulses. But when they are green with the pod and, uh, you know, the, the, the seeds inside, they are classified as vegetables under the category pods and seeds. Then we have our snow, uh, snow peas here. They are peas, but they are, you know, not fully developed or fully grown. So when you have to prepare them, you have to prepare the whole thing, including the outer cover, the snow peas. We have the other category, uh, stems and shoots. And as the name suggests, they are gotten from the stem part of um, a plant and then some shoots, you know, that are sprouting. And we have examples of celery. We have asparagus. We have artichokes. For artichokes, we have two types. We have the globe artichoke and the Jerusalem artichoke. We have fennel. We have bamboo shoots. ETC, ETC. There are many examples of stems and shoots. Just a few examples we have on our illustrations here. The first one, we have celery. It's green, but then it has some green, you know, deep green shoots. Celery is very common for making soups, for stalks, for stews. And it has a characteristic pungent, you know, not really pungent, but very strong, you know, smell and even the flavor. It is also very excellent uh, in flavoring many dishes. That's celery. We have uh, asparagus here. The asparagus, you normally cut, you know, the whole of it. Even for celery, you can take the, the, the stem as well as the shoots. The asparagus, the same way. Then we have artichoke. And I said we have two types of artichoke. There's another one. This is globe. And then we have Jerusalem artichoke. So simply what has happened is that most of the leaves have been removed. And then the inner part, the core has been removed. And then it is prepared as it is. You can steam them. You can stew them. You can fry them. There are many varieties of cooking methods that can be used for stems and shoots. Then we have what we call fruiting vegetables. Fruiting vegetables. Uh, this is different from fruits. Don't confuse between fruits and fruiting vegetables. Fruits are different. Here we are talking about fruiting vegetables. Remember when I began, I said that botanically, because we use the botanical classification in the kitchen, we classify a plant, uh, I mean, a, a vegetable according to the part of the plant that it has been taken from or it, 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 it comes from. So for fruiting vegetables, as long as it is a fruit, it is, it is taking, playing the role of a fruit, 
and it's a vegetable so it falls under this particular category of fruiting vegetables just to go to the example so that you can understand it better we have the eggplant or abajin the eggplant or uh, abajin in swahili we call it biriganya so that you can better understand it we have avocado we have cucumbers we have kujets or zucchini we have peppers and for peppers we have all types of peppers we have the green pepper we have the red pepper we have the yellow pepper there are many and these are the sweet bell peppers you're not talking about the chilies eh? although chilies also will fall under this category most commonly known fruiting vegetables tomatoes we use them almost in every uh, meal when we cook we also have pumpkins and pumpkins are many malenge we have the 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 the, the uh, varieties different varieties of pumpkins and uh, they can be also cooked in different uh, styles we have the squash we have the acorn squash we have the normal pumpkins and so on and so forth okay so these are the fruiting vegetables and i say they should not be confused with the uh, fruits so examples as you can see on the illustration we have the avocado there it is a vegetable an excellent vegetable avocados can actually be used uh, as appetizers or starters you can have avocado salad like for example you also have guacamole salad it's, it's, it's an excellent type of a salad made and used in different ways in the kitchen or served in, uh, differently so avocado I believe everybody understands or knows uh, what an avocado is we have the eggplant or uh, the biriganya as I said in Swahili this is the Italian eggplant it's kind of dark dark purple in color then we have the white eggplant this is also an eggplant but white in color we have the tomatoes commonly known nyanya everybody knows uh, tomatoes you all understand about tomatoes we have this these are the uh, red chilies the chilies when it's green before it ripens then red when it actually ripens the chilies they are hot chilies you know they have you know the hotness then we have green pepper ho ho in swahili we commonly it's commonly known as ho ho it's a type of a pepper and a fruiting vegetable and we have for the for the uh, uh, peppers i talked about green peppers i talked about red pepper and there's also uh, yellow pepper these ones are sweet they are not hot like uh, the chilies so all these are examples of fruiting um, vegetables then to the final category of vegetables we have mushrooms and fungi now these ones we may not say that they are very common simply because there's one main reason for mushrooms you have to be very careful where you outsource them you don't just go you know collecting wild mushrooms anyhow because they are highly 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 poisonous they can actually be deadly you know so you don't just go picking them anywhere and even buying you have to buy from reliable sources so mushrooms and they are available in many uh, different uh, modes or you know uh, styles they can be dried for preservation they can be canned or, or they can be pickled in some brine or salt water and they could also be fresh because they are those that are readily available from, uh, from suppliers in, in different farms. And of course, you have to be very careful that you don't buy those poisonous species. So we also have many different types of mushrooms, very many as they can be. But remember I said some are highly poisonous. Just a few examples that I've given on our illustrations here. We have the shitek mushrooms. This is basically how they look like. We have the oyster mushrooms, we have the cremini mushrooms, and we have the chanterelle mushrooms. These are just a few species of mushrooms that are available. So those are just nine classifications of vegetables that we have. Uh, let's look at how do we control changes during cooking? How do we make sure that if it is texture, it doesn't change uh, and make the, 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 the vegetables really look mushy or anything of the sort. Remember, I began by saying that we should always make sure we preserve the color, the flavor, the texture, and everything else as far as the vegetables are concerned so that they can also be eye appealing and appetizing to uh, the diners or to our customers. So when controlling changes during cooking, let's look at number one, texture changes. And we are going to look at how texture changes when cooking uh, vegetables. Now, under texture, we are going to look at some of the contents in um, our vegetables because, like I said, they are nutritious and, of course, they have their, you know, uh, their, their components. We have fiber, we have starch, we have all these. 
but we must aspire to preserve them as much as we, we can. So let's start with fiber because it is the content. This is basically the fibrous material that holds a plant together. And this is basically the dietary fiber that I'm talking about. Now, this one, it is usually affected in different ways. Number one, it can be firm or it can be mushy. So what makes fiber to be firm? When you cook your vegetables, what will make them to be firm and not mushy? Number one, acids. We have acids. And we are told they extend cooking time. For example, lemon juice, we have vinegar, etc. So when you're cooking your vegetables, like for example, the green leafy vegetables, they are rich in fiber. If you add some acid, get to know that cooking time will be longer because they make the fiber to be firm and therefore it is not going to cook very fast. So that is a fact you must understand. Number two, we have sugars, sugars. The vegetables also are rich in, they also contain some sugar in them. And depending on the category or classification, as we have seen, some are richer in sugar, some may not have so much sugar. So whichever the kind of vegetables you're cooking, it is important you understand that if you add sugar, it will have an effect on the fiber. So it is strengthens the cell structure. And this principle is very important in fruit cookery. And when we talk about fruits, we are also talking about now the actual fruits apart from vegetables. Eh? For example, because sometimes we also have some fruits that we cook, like apples, like pears, and we also have some, uh, you know, some fruit, uh, fruiting vegetables that we also cook and add some sugar for stability or for firmness. So they will not mash very fast if you add some sugar. It will make it more strong. Okay, so those are factors that actually make fiber to be more firm. Then we have the opposite of that. What makes fiber to be soft? So basically this is what causes mushiness in your vegetables. Number one, we have heat. Fiber is softened by heat. So you need to know how long do I have to cook my vegetables? There are those that you have to cook for slightly longer. For example, root vegetables, like, uh, or even the, the, the tubers. The sweet potatoes, if you have to cook them, you have to boil them, and they have to take quite some time before they are they are ready. You cannot compare that with the leafy vegetables like the spinach. The spinach will only need a few minutes and not too much heat and they will be ready. But for the root vegetables and the tubers, you'll have to cook them actually for longer. So heat in general, it affects uh, fiber. So longer cooking means softer vegetables. So you need to understand what you really want. Number two, we have alkalis. The alkalis, for example, baking soda. There are many people who are fond of adding baking powder, especially when they are preparing uh, mashed uh, foods with, 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 with some vegetables so that it can make them softer. So do not add baking soda to green vegetables. It destroys the vitamins. Actually, it denatures the vitamins completely and makes the vegetables to be unpleasantly mushy. This is a common practice, especially when people are preparing a certain traditional food we call irio or mukimo. They add this soda, baking soda, to make the green vegetables more mushy so that they can be mashed. Fine, it's okay, they will be mashed, but you'll have lost all the vitamins. So this should be avoided. When you're cooking vegetables, don't add baking soda. We continue. That is fiber number two. Now we have starch. It is another content of uh, vegetables. Different vegetables have starch in them. And we have two types of starch. One, we have the dry starchy foods, like dried legumes. I talked about uh, beans pods and seeds and I say that um, when they are green they are vegetables but when they are dry they are legumes so these are the legumes you're referring to here now the beans the peas as long as they are dry the lentils if you these are examples of dry foods and these are how they are affected by cooking so they must be cooked in enough water for the starch granules to absorb moisture and soften Actually, for beans, we all know what we do. We, cook, uh, we soak them overnight. If you're going to prepare them tomorrow, you soak them overnight to soften them. And because already the drying process has already made the moisture to be lost, you're kind of replacing that moisture. They will not take too long when you're cooking if you have already soaked them overnight. So basically, that is what you must understand about dry, starchy foods. Number two, we have moist, starchy vegetables like potatoes and sweet potatoes. They are moist because they still have some of their, they are not dried. They have, still have some of their moisture with them. And therefore, even when cooking them, it will be different from the dry, starchy foods. So for them, 
we are saying they have enough moisture of their own, but they must still be cooked until the starch granules soften, but not over soften so that they are so mushy. We continue with texture changes and we are looking at doneness. Doneness here means readiness. When do you know that a vegetable is ready? It's completely cooked and therefore, you know, you need maybe to uh, get it out of the source of heat and serve it. A vegetable is said to be done when it reaches the desired degree of tenderness. Tenderness is actually softness. We are saying desired degree. You know, tenderness could mean already mashed and overcooked. But we are not referring to that particular tenderness. And the veg these veget stages vary from one vegetable to the other. A simple example is, compare a root vegetable and a green leafy vegetable. I said spinach will cook very fast, potatoes will take a little bit of some time. We have some guidelines that we need to follow in order to achieve the correct doneness or readiness in vegetables. Number one, don't overcook. That is a rule of the thumb. Don't overcook. Now here, the recipe may really... Uh, tell you to cook for this uh, long time, uh, I mean time, uh, amount of time. But remember, you could be having some very tender carrots, some that are very younger, others are very, you know, they, 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 they are really overgrown. So they will require different cooking time. And this is where we say as a chef, you must use what we call cooking with judgment. You use your own judgment. And here we use our five senses to judge. Number one, we have the sense of sight. You look at that particular vegetable when it is cooking. How does it look? How is the color? Is it done or not? Do you need to give it more time or is it time now to remove it and serve it? So use your sense of sight. Number two, we have sense of smell. As it cooks, of course, they are the, you know, the aromas that they produce. So that will also tell you whether a vegetable is ready or not. And of course, you have your sense of touch. This is where you really use your, 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 your fingers and you touch. If they are tender enough, then it's time to remove them from the source of heat. If they are not, you give them a little bit of some time. At the same time, we have the sense of taste. And as a chef, as you cook, you must evaluate your cooking. So how do you get to know that a food is ready? So by testing. So we use all these parameters to make sure that number one, rule number one, don't overcook. Number two, cook as close to service as possible. This is very, very important. Unlike other foods that can be cooked and uh, preserved in the buffet table or in hot uh, dishes for vegetables, you may not because they will overcook. So cook as close as possible to, tire, to serve its time because holding vegetables in a steam table continues to cook them and you realize they actually overcook. So that should be avoided. Guideline number three, if vegetables must be cooked in advance, then slightly undercook them. If, for example, you're expecting a large number of people and you really need the food to be ready in good time. For vegetables, if you must or, uh, cook them in advance, then undercook them. Because when you put them in the steam tables or in the shaving dishes, in the source of heat, they will continue cooking. So don't uh, cook them completely. Rule number four, for uniform doneness, so that they can cook completely or uniformly, cut vegetables into pieces of uniform size before cooking. You know, when you're cutting your vegetables, you don't just cut without a thought. You don't just chop up roughly or, you know, in any shape. We have some definite shapes, as we shall see, for vegetables that we cut. So you either have this cut or the other. And that makes sure that your vegetables will cook uniformly. You don't have some parts of the vegetables that are very raw, others are cooked, properly cooked, others are overcooked. You want to avoid that by making sure that you have some definite vegetable cuts. Rule number five, vegetables with both tough and tender parts need special treatment so that the tender parts are not overcooked by the time the tougher parts are. Yes, we have some, like for example, the artichoke that I showed you on uh, the, 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 the categories of vegetables. Some, the outer parts of the leaves are actually very tough. So those ones may need more time to cook than the inside part, which is more tender. So in case you have a vegetable that has some harder parts and others are soft, then you need to understand that so that you can, you don't cook it at the same time so that you overcook the softer parts. That's very important. Rule number six, do not mix batches of cooked vegetables. If, for example, there are vegetables that had been cooked earlier, and more so if they are green leafy vegetables like spinach, you had cooked some batches earlier, and then you're cooking others and you want to combine them. That is a no-no because you're going to overcook the ones that were already cooked. That should be avoided. 
Uh, so that is enough for the, you know, controlling doneness, making sure that you have the right, the appropriate degree of cooking. And now we want to go to controlling flavor changes. That was texture. When you touch them, you know, how a vegetable feels. And remember, texture is also determined by the mouth, your mouth. When you eat, is it soft, is it hard? Now we are looking at flavor, uh, flavor changes still by the sense of, um, you know, taste, okay? So how do you tell the flavor is good or not? How do we control flavor changes? Number one, you must understand that cooking produces flavor loss. That is definite. It's, it's outright. That is all we are told for some vegetables. They are better eaten raw because then you have all the nutrients, you have all the flavor. Cooking, because there is the effect of heat, also makes some flavor to be lost. And this can be controlled in several ways. How do we control loss of flavor? Number one, cooking as short, for a short time as possible. We are still going to the, 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 the other guidelines on doneness. Don't overcook. So you cook for a short time as possible. Number two, use boiling water that is salted to shorten cooking time. When you use boiling water, then it means you will not cook this vegetable for too long because already there is heat in the hot water. And salt is normally added. Eh? Actually, it is as a way of pre-cooking or per cooking or what we call blanching the vegetables in advance. This way you won't have to overcook them. And the addition of salt, we are told, also helps in reducing flavor loss. Number three, use just enough water to, uh, to cover in order to minimize what we call leaching. Leaching is that uh, aspect of losing nutrients in the, in the cooking liquid, whether it is water, whether it is stock. So when nutrients actually dissolve in the cooking liquid, that is what we call leaching. So you just use just enough water. Don't, you know, submerge vegetables in, 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 in water. Otherwise, all the nutrients will actually be leached. That should be avoided. Uh, factor number four, Steam vegetables whenever appropriate. Actually, steaming is one of the best and the safest method for cooking a majority of the vegetables because it preserves almost all nutrients. Of course, there are some nutrients that will be lost, but not that much, like when you boil. For example, you can imagine boiling spinach and steaming spinach. Boiling all the vegetable um, chlorophyll and the vitamins, will actually be lost. All the nutrients will actually be leached or lost in the, in the boiling, in the water. But when you steam, when you steam, you preserve most of these nutrients, which is very, very important. Uh, then we continue with uh, how cooking produces flavor changes. Cooked vegetables do not taste like raw vegetables. Why? Because cooking produces certain chemical changes. Actually, where we can't eat all vegetables raw, for example, you can imagine having to eat... Um, Irish potatoes, when they are raw, I mean, it's not, they are not palatable. So either way, we have to cook them, and therefore we must understand that, yes, we have to cook. That means some flavor will be lost. But what do we do so that even if some flavor will be lost, it will still be, the meal or the vegetable will still be uh, desirable. What we, do we need to do? It is important that we understand all these factors. Overcooking produces undesirable changes. That is obvious, and therefore, and especially some types or classifications of vegetables, like the cabbage family. You can imagine having a, to be served a meal and the, the vegetable is actually cabbage and it's already overcooked. It's even looking grayish. It's white cabbage, but it's looking grayish. Or it's a green cabbage, but it's looking off color. So it is very undesirable. So that is something that must be remembered. Very, very important. So it is important to preserve as much natural color as possible when cooking. Customers may reject or accept a vegetable on the basis of its appearance. We always say that the eye eats first. So you look at a plate of food and the vegetables and the other components are appealing and you get appetized. The digestive juices start flowing and you're ready for the meal. So when you look at a plate and the cabbage is already mashed and overcooked, customers will outrightly reject that particular food. They will accept it if the opposite is true. The vegetables have not been overcooked, they are not overdone, they have the right color, the right texture, the aroma or the flavor, the smell is nice, so they will be able to appreciate uh, that. So it is important. We have what we call pigments. Pigments are colorations in vegetables. For the green leafy vegetables, we talked about the green coloring matter called chlorophyll. Very, very important. That should also be retained. The green 
coloring matter of the green leafy vegetables. So these pigments, they are compounds that give vegetables their color. And different pigments react in different ways to heat and to acids and other elements that may be present during cooking. We are not talking about chlorophyll alone. We also have carotenoids, you know, like from uh, tomatoes. We also have flavonoids and all that from carrots and all that. So that uh, red and, and orange coloring matter should also be conserved or preserved so that you don't have carrots that are looking, you know, a different color, totally different. You can't have carrots that are looking yellow, yet we know they're supposed to be, you know, some orange color. That's very important. Uh, we continue with controlling nutrient losses, and we're told that vegetables are major sources of vitamin A, vitamin C, and they are also rich in other vitamins as well as minerals or mineral salts. So there are six factors that are responsible for most nutrient loss. So what will you do? What do you need to understand so that you can conserve or preserve most of these nutrients? What makes nutrients to be lost? Factor number one, high temperature. Of course, I talked about making sure that you check on your cooking time. Very, very important. Number two, long cooking. If you cook your vegetables for long, what is going to happen? You may not, but high temperature means it's high even though you're cooking the vegetables for short time. But when you're talking about long cooking, you're overcooking your vegetables. That destroys the nutrients. Number three, we have leaching. I talked about this being dissolving out the, uh, the nutrients in the liquid that you're using to cook. We have use of alkalis. I talked about baking soda. And we also have another uh, uh, factor, hard water. Hard water contains so many minerals, eh, including ev even some that are alkaline. So it is always important that you know the source of your water. Is it hard water or not? If it is hard water, just boil it to you know, remove most of the, the hardness. Okay? Next, we have plant enzymes. These are active at warm temperatures but destroyed by high temperatures. We have some vegetables, of course, that have their own enzymes in themselves as part of plant enzymes. And you must understand that this may cause the loss of some of these nutrients. A very good example is uh, like potatoes. When you cut, when you peel potatoes and you cut them, if you leave them, they'll start undergoing what we call enzymatic browning it's because of the effect of enzymes. Then exposure, and that brings us to point number six, oxygen. So when you cut vegetables and you expose them, of course, they will lose their, their nutrients into the, into the atmosphere because oxygen affects them. Just like I talked about uh, potatoes and cutting them and exposing them. That is something that has to be remembered. Let's now look at standards of quality in cooked vegetables. How do you evaluate? How should uh, good cooked vegetables look in terms of the following aspects? Number one, color. How should the color of vegetables, cooked vegetables be? Bright and natural. If it is dull and looks artificial, then you get to know that something has been done. The cooking has been doctored. And this is what we want to avoid because we want to serve natural products that are very healthy, that are very safe. Green vegetables should be fresh and bright green. So that is color. And we said you're using all your sensory parameters. So you're using your sense of sight to tell that the color is the appropriate one. Number two, we have appearance on the plate. On the plate, when the food is now plated, how should it appear? It should be neat and uniform. So you should cut neatly and uniformly the vegetables. I said we don't just chop in, you know, roughly and, 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 you know, cook as long as, you know, the food is going to be chewed. No, we don't assume. You have to make sure that you give it a thought. You cut the vegetables appropriately and uniformly. Attractively arranged on the plate, you don't just, you know, uh, plate in a floppy manner that some, some vegetables will actually fall on the rim of the plate. No, you avoid that. You give it a thought. You make sure that you even have some scoops to make sure that you attractively arrange your vegetables on the plate. And then not swimming in cooking water. In as much as maybe you used a liquid like water or stock to cook your vegetables, it should not be too much so that when you plate, the vegetables are actually swimming in that particular water. That is wrong. Next, we have texture. So how do you get to know that uh, vegetables are well cooked? Cook to the right degree of doneness, very, very important. Very, very important. Not overcooking, not undercooking. Most vegetables should be crisp, tender, not overcooked or mushy. So there's that crispness. And that one you can tell when you test or even when you test with your with your fingers, the doneness. So the texture should be the right degree, not overdone. Number four, we have flavor. So this one you have to test. It should be full, 
you know, fullness of flavor means that you can tell, yes, this is uh, steamed spinach and not, you know, you're not, you're not really wondering, is this really spinach? So there's fullness of flavor, full natural and sweetness, what we call garden fresh flavor. You know, they taste like just the way they came from the garden naturally. Then we have seasonings, use of seasonings. Of course, we have many different seasonings in the kitchen. Salt is the most commonly used seasoning agent. We have pepper, all types of pepper, black pepper, white pepper, etc. When you use seasonings, we are told you should use lightly and appropriately. Not too strong to mask the natural garden flavors. So if you have a salt, what is going to happen? You know, the, the, the salt will be too much. Uh, the customers will not even enjoy the natural taste of your of your vegetables so that should be avoided and not only salt even pepper and all the other seasoning agents number six we have sauces and these are excellent because they help the food to have good texture not to be too dry so for the sauces they should just enhance and not cover up so you don't just dribble a lot of tomato sauce on top of your of your vegetables or in the cooking sauce so that you don't tell that this is spinach or this is whatever vegetable you can tell the the taste of them of the sauce that's wrong vegetable combinations so when you have to cook because you also have what we call mixed vegetables you take these and these and these vegetables especially for root vegetables and also fruit vegetables we also mix them together you know to make it even more lively and more interesting and more nutritious so when you have these combinations uh, if you're not careful sometimes you may end up losing the flavor because some will uh, overdo the others they will dominate so you need to be careful so have what we call interesting combinations in order to attract your customers so flavors colors and shapes should be pleasing in combination so you need to also take uh, uh, vegetables that have can harmonize they can go well together not those that actually are contrasting or one is detracting from the others so these are ways and means of making sure that you know your your vegetables are okay they, they they are properly cooked they are of quality the taste the smell the flavor and everything else is actually very very well done now we just i just talked about um vegetables that we, they don't just happen to be on the plate they don't just happen you have to give it a thought by making sure that from the word go when you outsource them when you source them from the supplier or from your stores you of course have to take them through there the, the the correct sequence or you know uh, stages you clean them very nicely when it comes now to preparation before actual cooking we have the cutting up or the chopping up you don't just cut them anyhow without a thought there's a lot of you giving it a thought you need to give it a thought you need to be very artistic and therefore this brings us to the end of vegetable cuts different vegetable cuts we have many so many of them actually the variety the list is endless so for the chef here as a food preparation worker and of course when you also have to serve you also have to serve something that you're feeling proud about like a professional so you give it a thought and you have to know which vegetable cut am i going to cut for example if you have your carrots which is the best style and i want to say that most of the solid vegetables like especially the root vegetables and even the tubers they will you can have as many styles as possible one is carrots you can have many like about even more than 10 cuts or styles of vegetable cut from carrots so let's look at some of them as you can see on the illustrations here we have the first one as you can see this is a carrot and it has been cut into how many all these different shapes and cuts so i mean you can be as artistic as you can be so the first one we call it a butternut butternut it is actually like much stick you know the size of a match stick but very thick so this is what we call a butternut then we have sliced carrots just round you know cuts rings we have dices you cut it like into cubes okay bigger then we have the cubes i mean the dices are smaller than than cubes but we can also have big dices and small dices then we have the cubes just like a cube you can cut them diagonally we also call them lozenges these ones then thin julian julian is a long thin cut longer and thinner than the butternut then we have mincing minced carrots mincing is like mincemeat eh? very small 
tiny cuts. So you can see you can be very creative and artistic just by one vegetable, carrot. So when you do this, you can imagine for somebody who roughly chopped their carrots and served the customers, eh? if you are two people seated on one, one table and you're being served, one, one of them, uh, one of you is served with uh, maybe butternuts or very nice carefully cut shapes. And for you, yours are roughly chopped. Of course, you'll be a me witness that uh, you will feel cheated. You don't get value for your money. We continue, we still have some more basic cuts. We have the slices, we had seen them there. The diagonals or what I call the lozenges, they are there. Then this is a coarse chop. Now, when we just uh, chop coarsely or just roughly, in most cases you find that those that are done roughly, they are for like maybe soups, because it will not appear on the plate of the customer, maybe you'll have to blend and therefore, whether you cut it large or small, it will not matter to the customer. Then we have the dices, like they were there. We have um, brunoise. We, call, we pronounce this as brunoise, as you can see, even the pronunciation there. They are very small dices, very small, tiny. And then we have mincing. We had seen it in the other picture. Then we have the batonets. We had seen them. Then we have the julienne. I said these are very long, thin cuts. And as you can see, carrot is also appearing here. So those solid vegetables can be cut into varieties of shapes. We have the batonets here, a baton. Here now you can see it is very clear. A jardinier, that is the cut. We have a lumet. This one is also done for uh, potatoes. It comes out very well. Julienne, but now this is not fine julienne. It is slightly thicker than the one we had seen. We have the pesan. This is how it looks like. It is like a cube but very thin. Then we have our dice. We had seen a dice. We have our brunoise here. And then we have mincing. So all these are more vegetable cuts. Then we have this large dices. I say dices can be small, can be big, because even the brunoise here is a dice but very, very small or very thin. We have a medium dice, a large dice, and then of course brunoise is a small dice. We have the butternets. I said they are like much sticks, but slightly longer. Then we have small dices. We have our julien here. You can see these two are julien, but one is finer. You cut it thinner and longer. The other one is slightly, you know, uh, thicker or, or, or bigger in size. And then we have the fine brunoise. These two are brunoise. This one is slightly bigger. This one is very fine. So you can imagine if you have your customers waiting for that plate of food and you have really given it a thought, you have cut your vegetables, you have given it enough time. You have cut your vegetables very well. So your customers are going to enjoy it and they will feel that they have gotten value for their money. And of course, you'll have what we call repeat business because in hospitality industry, your customer really matters. You want that customer to come tomorrow and you want to make more money, you want to continue having your business. And that is the reason why customers will prefer one um, food service operation to the other. They will always flock to one pa uh, play, uh, I mean operation because they, they, they are given value for their money because of such things. So as a chef, you cannot let your customers disappointed. If you can be this creative, if you can be this artistic, and vegetables here have given you all this chance, I mean, to be as creative as you can. So thank you so much. That marks the end of our lesson on vegetables. You can actually practice with most of this, even at home, even now. You can start now cooking, you know, uh, artistically you don't now just cut for the sake of it we don't just eat to stay alive but you eat something that you are really enjoying for now thank you so much bye be safe see you next time these televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our mku online platform you can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform we are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.